Um, so like she said, I'm from Oshner Health System, and um, I'm trying to give you a little perspective about um, what we do on the health um, delivery side. So I have some examples of models we implemented and even where we play in the space. Um, so those of you who don't know, Oshner's um, in headquartered in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, we're growing across all Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Um, so it was a nice trip out here. It's about 90 and humid already there. Um, and I want to show you this very complex slide about our IT strategy over the last 10 years. It took me a while to make this. Um, and the reason why I put this up is because for us on the health delivery side, we do have really low margins. And as we grow, Oshner's um, growing. Um, we take over a couple of hospitals a year and partner up. As we, uh, we grow, it's really important that we maintain IT, system-wide IT system standardization. Um, it's very difficult for you to survive uh, in your IT department to survive if you have five different EMRs across three states. It's very complex. So as we grow, it's very critical that we keep this in mind, that we can implement things system-wide system quicker if we're all using the same platforms. So we have the Epic EMR, and our goal is to get that in every single facility as we grow. Um, that leads to speed and flexibility for all of our interventions and hopefully innovation on top of that, which is part of the, the reason why the innovation department can exist is because we've done a fabulous job keeping system-wide standards and we can build on top of those, which led us into an AI strategy which there's nothing shocking here, but for us, we have a really great competitive advantage because of that system-wide standard. We can acquire a data set across every facility because we're on one EMR. Uh, if we're talking about nurse scheduling and we want to do capacity predictions, everybody schedules in one system. So it really decreases the complexity and allows us to take all of our data across all facilities and really quickly create models off of that. It actually gives us more time to shadow our end users and figure out the real workflows that are going on in the facility just because uh, there's a flow sheet inside of Epic that's supposed to be documented in this workflow doesn't mean they do that. So the cleanliness of your data is very important. And because we have one system across everywhere, we get to spend time shadowing end users and developing the real workflow and extracting that data meaningfully. Um, it also gives us extra time to keep up on research and then really brainstorm what can we do with this? Making a clear intervention that can be distributed across all of our facilities. And in fact, it's actually probably the most important thing for us to do is create models that can affect outcomes. So pretty much the entire process for us starts with, if we knew this would happen, what would we do with it? And if we can't figure out what we would do with it, we kind of put that on the shelf until we do. So everything pretty much starts out what are the outcomes we're trying to affect? How can we get there? And then we'll go through the process of extracting data and creating models that can facilitate that intervention. Um, so where do we, Oshner Health System, kind of play in this field? So don't be offended by anything on here. This is a representation of where like, I personally fit into this and what we think we are the best at and where we're going to play. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how transferable our models. Um, so if it's quite transferable and I can buy this, in the bottom right corner, let's say I want a flight risk model where it's kind of low complexity and there's not a lot of variation state to state and I can buy something like that and it's going to work well, I'll go ahead and buy that and I'll implement it right now. And there's it, really, it's, just, it's as simple as that, I'll buy it and implement it. Um, medical photography, I can't, I'm not going to compete there. A small health system in New Orleans, Louisiana, I'm not going to compete there. Also, you don't need my clinical expertise to interpret and label this. You need some physicians. So I don't really play in the medical photography space right now. I don't have the most images. And I have lots of great workflow experience, but a labeled image versus all the new techniques we're developing doesn't fit with a health system. Um, and then tra non-transferable models, let's say on the top, um, I would say the Watson cancer you know, trials that have been um, widely publicized, um, there wasn't really clear interventions. And so those are the things that we're going to wait to see if others can pull that off before we implement it. And then I play in the upper right hand space. So what, it, where is there lots of clinical variability, 
lots of interpret room for interpretation for the data that would make workflow experts and uh, care delivery organizations experts. That's where we play. So one of those examples is predicting hospital acquired C. diff in our organizations. We probably can't buy that model and a lot of non-healthcare experts probably can't make those models in the interventions. So this is where we're playing right here and I do have a couple examples of models we've created ourselves in the interventions and hopefully the positive outcomes that we can drive. Um, so first one, it's not clinically related, but it does really affect our, out, our access in our specialty um, clinics. Sometimes there's long lead times and patients not showing up for those appointments can hurt other patients and also cost the organization money. So the very first model we created three years ago was to prevent no-shows. So we started with the intervention. If we knew somebody wasn't going to show up, what would we do about it? Um, and ultimately, we want the patient to commit to the appointment or cancel the payment, appointment as early on as possible. Also, I can't afford to hire 50 people to call these people. I need existing staff to do it. So part of the challenge was how do I educate my staff about what machine learning is and then also make the calls every morning. And if you're making calls to everyone, stop making calls to everyone, only make calls to these two patients. So it was a great introduction, not just for us, but to the entire organization about what machine learning can do, what it cannot do, and then also different deployment strategies about how effective and costly is it to hire an entire team to do it or train 2,000 nurses. So I didn't have the money to, train, uh, to buy a whole new group, but we actually split tests right beforehand if I would call the patient versus their nurse. And we actually learned that nobody cares if I call, they care if the nurse calls and they're more likely to show up. So it kind of justified getting the individual nurses to make the calls. Um, it was our first foray into this, and how did we go about training? I drove to every single clinic over the summer and educated every single person. Um, it was the first one, nobody even knew much about machine learning. Uh, it was very, um, I would say, time consuming, but it actually helped us learn about what people, the culture that exists and then, then how we can change that culture to make sure we're doing things smarter. Um, we embedded all the tools directly inside of Epic. We didn't want to have a separate portal where they log in to. So it's very important that it's right inside of the day -to, their day-to-day -day workflow. So we created a little dashboard for people calling everybody, stop, only call two or three per physician. For people calling nobody, please start the first part of your day making those calls. Um, and so some of the outcomes. We used a couple million visits in our database we would evaluate the model right when the appointment is scheduled and then every day leading up to that appointment starting about seven days out because things can change as you confirm the appointment. Obviously, you know, two days before your risk can go down or if something else happens, your risk can go up. If you're admitted a week before, your risk of no-show goes up because you might not even be discharged. Um, and then our intervention was start texting those patients seven days out. Get them to, well, our idea was cancel. If they already know they're not going to show up, cancel at least a week out so we can fill the appointment. Um, and then, if they're still, they're still on for the appointment, have their individual nurse call them the day before and get them to commit to it or cancel that appointment. So I think this is very obvious. Our success was determined by if you make your calls or not, and it's pretty proportional. You make your calls, no sure rates go down. If you don't make your calls, uh, they stay the same. So we're lucky that with these learnings over the last couple of years, we've driven down our no-show rates about 20%. And that's super important, not just for us, it saves us a lot of money because we're seeing more patients, but our lead times for appointments are actually getting shorter. And with that, um, we actually uh, created a program where we can text out waitlist offers. We had a huge drive that if we're gonna get people to cancel their appointments three days out, we want a better way to fill them. So we actually send out a couple million texts a year to get people to fill those appointments that are being canceled. Up into even 90 minutes before the appointment, we're sending out texts saying App appointments available, you can come right in. So it was kind of a combined thing. If you're going to get people to cancel more, you need a way to uh, fill them too. So not just no-show rates going down, because you can just cancel them all and then not fill them, uh, fill the appointments too. So that was a pretty good introduction for our organization into machine learning and then, um, this last year, we actually started a program to prevent hospital-acquired C. diff, and this is a very fun program for us. We started with the intervention, and this is going to be interesting, so remember this. We wanted to do an antibiotic review by pharmacists. So let's filter out 
95% of the patients in the hospital, who are the ones that are most likely at the highest risk of developing C. diff that are in here? Let's have pharmacists review them, do a med review, discontinue any antibiotics, that's what the literature shows, do daily reviews until the risk goes back down, and then furthermore, let's have staff just use soap and water and not sanitizer and really wash their hands really well. So we thought this probably has legs, we could probably drive down C. diff rates, let's go ahead and make that model. So we pulled a couple years worth of admissions, not very, it's not that much when you're talking about a lot of data, but it was enough to get a pretty good model. But one of the most interesting things was the feature importances for this model was actually quite different than the literature. It showed that PPIs and H2 blockers were three times more important to discontinue than the antibiotics. So the intervention changed really quickly. We and I didn't have to drive to every clinic, there was only three pharmacists, so it was really quick to implement immediate results, and we're down about 40% over the last year just by really focusing those interventions on the patients who really need it. And that's kind of our goal, to have models filter out as many people as possible and do a more intense intervention on just the ones who really need it. Um, further examples, um, our rapid deterioration model. Uh, about two years ago, we implemented a new model to predict rapid deterioration. So vital signs, vi um, labs are all kind of, are, 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 you know, kind of ticking their way down, and then what's the point where we really want to have somebody come out there? And we focused it about a four-hour warning. Um, we had a rapid response team who responded to codes, now respond to kind of pre-code alerts. So these are the people most at risk for having a cardiac arrest, arrest on the floor. Um, and this has been wildly successful, lots of learnings in the hospital too. Um, and at the facilities who are using this, we've actually driven down cardiac arrest on, the on our floors by 25 to 40%. And we're actually continuing that, um, changing interventions as we go, as we get feedback. And this is kind of a progression of incorporating more people, more nurses, and the intervention has changed actually quite a bit over the last two years. Also, our CFO's favorite project that went live this year was more accurate at claims coding using artificial intelligence. Um, so our, a lot of our coders would go through and review um, every single note and claim and then code that claim and make sure it was accurate. And you know, for, if you're looking for different HCCs for your Medicare Advantage population, 95% of those could have absolutely no opportunity and you're just wasting your time. And as you hire more coders, it's more and more expensive to do the same exact work. It's not really value add, you're not hiring more doctors, you're just hiring more people in your corporate world. Uh, so we actually created language models and they were very difficult, like, we said previously, word embeddings didn't even really work on this. Uh, we were just, we're actually using one hots for our word embeddings, which was surprisingly more accurate than using anything right now. Um, and we're actually filtering out 98 to 90% of claim reviews and really only focusing on those one to 2%. And we're getting really great sensitivity in there and the coders are massively more efficient. So instead of having 20 coders review 50,000 claims, we're having two re review 2,000 claims. So our CFO is, is ecstatic for us doing this, you know? So um, again, not much time, but um, that's one example. One thing too, as a health system, I get to create data sets too. So for this, we had a moonshot. One of our things was, well, we have a heart failure program. We want you to step on a scale every day. If you gain weight, we'll tell you to double up on your meds. And the problem is a lot of people refuse to step on the scale. So what if we could create our own data set of voices? You know, new research shows that your voice could maybe show signs of heart disease. What, it could what if it could show signs of edema? And there is no data set. But as a health system, we actually are starting to capture a voice data set and marrying those up with actual radar measurements to get exact uh, fluid levels inside of your lungs to see if we can do some research that can match that up. And then you have a completely passive intervention at home where somebody can sit on their couch and talk to each other and then you're actually measuring, is there a risk right now of readmission? I don't know if it'll work, but again, as a health system, I kind of want to point out that we're not you know, locked into the data that we have in our EMR, we get to create our own data sets. So this is just a super exciting project that we're working on and I am out of time. Thank you very much.